Deuteronomy 16. Observe the month of Abab, and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abab the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God, of the flock and the herd, in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread there with, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. And there shall be no leavened bread seen with thee in all thy coast seven days. Neither shall there any thing of the flesh which thou sacrifice the first day at even remain all night until the morning thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover with in any of thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even and the going down of the sun at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. And thou shalt roast and eat it in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt turn in the morning and go unto thy tents. Six days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a sol solemn assembly to the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work therein. Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest, to put the sickle to the crown, corn. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God, the tribute of a free will offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son and thy daughter, and thy manservant, and thy maidservant, and the Levite that is within thy gates, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow that are among you, and the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and thou shalt observe and do these statutes. Thou shalt observe the feast of tabernacles seven days. After that thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine. Thou shalt rejoice in thy feast, thou and thy son, and thy daughter, and thy manservant, and thy maidservant, and the Levite, the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow that are within thy gates. Seven days shalt thou keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God, in the place which the Lord shall choose, because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thine increase, and all thine works of thine hands. Therefore thou shalt surely rejoice. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God, in the place which he shall choose, in the feast of unleavened bread, in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. Judges and officers shall thou Make thee and all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just, just judgment. Thou shalt not rest judgment, thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise, and pervert the words of the righteous. That which is altogether just shall thou follow, that thou mayest live and and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou make thee. Neither shalt thou set thee up any image which the Lord thy God hateth. Thank you, brother. All right, Deuteronomy 16, uh, regarding specifically three solemn yearly feasts of the Lord in the time of Israel. Um, I could go and spend literally weeks on each one of these, and I have before. Mm -hmm. It's more of a Sunday school teaching uh, 
than really preaching, but there's a lot there. There's a lot to it. For more detail, go to Deut- or Leviticus chapter 23. And Leviticus 23 starts to take these and expound them a little bit more. Now, the presumption is that if you're at Deuteronomy, in the time of Deuteronomy, and these revelations coming to pass, then you would already have known and read and studied Leviticus. And these people in general have already been performing these. He's just reiterating these different feasts and, and giving more explanation as he has been throughout Deuteronomy. So again, Leviticus 23 will give you more detail. Um, and each particular feast actually plays out individually throughout the scriptures as well. And you can go and you can search each type and eventually find more information about it. But I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time. I want to get through Deuteronomy 16 today. It'll be up to you to go and study those things if you're interested. First in verse 1 it says, Observe the month Abib and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. If you were to go to Exodus chapter 12, you don't have to. That's where you find the Exodus, that first Passover and how it took place. The month Abib, God clearly indicates in Exodus 12 and verse 2, that this is the first month of the year unto you. So this event, the Passover, this month, Abib, actually kicked off what was the lunar calendar. Now to us, it usually arrives sometime around our March and our April. But the lunar calendar is a little bit different, and they would actually time the sequence of the moons in the different phases, and that's how they would pinpoint their month, Abib, in the beginning of that. Ours is a different calendar altogether, and that's why our day Passover, or what we celebrate as Easter, they don't exactly line up the same way that Old Testament Israel would have had it line up. But again, this is tied to that first night where Egypt's firstborn fell as God told Israel to play out the Passover before him. We all know the story, I think, that the sacrifice was made and the blood was put on the doorpost. And when I see the blood, God said, I will pass over you. So that blood was a sign, a token of a covenant between God and his people that they would not lose their firstborn if the blood was on the doorpost. Symbolizes the perfect sacrifice of Christ. He gave himself, God gave himself his firstborn unto the people. And that that is one of the many pictures in the Old Testament of Christ's sacrifice for us. Verse 2, actually I'll continue reading that. For in the month Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. And that's what I just referred to. Verse 2 says, Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock and the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. So the Passover we all know, was to be a lamb without blemish. He said, take it of the flock and of the herd. Very briefly, the people were to choose a lamb a few days prior and follow this lamb, make sure it didn't get scratched or become sick or anything like that. This lamb, this Passover lamb, was to be without blemish. And here, God, though then it was done in their own house, now he's starting to indicate a transition that's taking place where he says, You shall sacrifice the Passover unto me in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. We've seen that phrase throughout Deuteronomy multiple times. He keeps referring to the place that he's going to choose, the place that he's going to choose. It's a promised land with a promised place within that land. And they're obviously not there yet. Otherwise, he would say, sacrifice it there. And he would just point it out. Here he's actually indicating that it's a time to come. This Passover without blemish, this lamb without blemish, in the place that the Lord chooses will be sacrificed. Verse 3 says, Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. So seven days there would take place what is referred to as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Passover the first night and then seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. At the time of preparation of that first lamb that was slain that day, that first day, They would also be putting out the leaven out of their house. They would be preparing a new lump free of leaven. They'd eat unleavened bread because leaven then was a type of sin unto them as they're putting it out and they're preparing the lamb that would ultimately be a picture of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world which would take away all of their sins. This was all a picture and a type. The Feast of Unleavened Bread then couples with the Passover. Now, 
as we read through this, we're going to find actually that there's several feasts that are coupled and, and, and put into the context of each of these. But God's really only bringing up three because he's put the other ones underneath it. When he's talking about no unleavened bread, seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread, that specifically is known as the feast of unleavened bread. Again, Leviticus 23 will clarify that for you. He says to eat the bread of affliction there in verse 3, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. So when you're fleeing, when you're in haste, which is what the children of Israel did, there's not a lot of time to prepare. There's not a lot of time to gather much things and much stuff. They they fled by night in, in, in haste and in, in, in confusion and in worry and in trouble. It was a time of troublous times. It was a time where necessity only would what be what you would gather and what you would grab to yourselves. And that's why he says it's the bread of affliction. They went out of Egypt with many things that were bestowed upon them from the Egyptians because of the blessing of the Lord God there. But certainly they didn't go out with everything that they had. They didn't travel fully as we would prepare our whole house and throw it in a moving truck and move that way. No, it would have been let's fill a small car with whatever we have and travel that way if you can imagine that. Your whole house, you're leaving things because you can only grab what is ne necessary, what is needful at that time. The bread of affliction and that feast of unleavened bread, it talks about essentially, I think, I think a removal of even weights. Hebrews says uh, it talks about first our sins of course right we need to get rid of our sins we need christ to per, like to save us from our Amen. sins but hebrews has this other other category called weights let us lay aside the weights which so easily beset us and i think that's what happened when they left in haste in the night and took upon themselves the bread of affliction only he's talking about leaving also weights your sins are going to be cleansed with the passover and the blood on your doorpost weights ought to be cleansed in the same fashion. The weights then, what is that? Well, these are things that aren't necessarily sinful, but that weigh you down from having a successful Christian life. What could a weight be? Well, it could just be spending a lot of time on, on YouTube. YouTube, you know, that's great for getting information. I'm going to figure out how to fix Caleb's RC vehicle later out on YouTube. That's great, but if I'm just sitting there watching videos one after another, clicking on the next recommended video, though that's not always wise, given the algorithm seems to have changed, it's going to refer me to something like Charles Stanley or, or what have you, but that can be a weight. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily sin to watch YouTube, but if that's hindering your Bible reading, it's become sin unto you. And that's what God's referring to when he says, hey, you got to get rid of the sins. You also have to get rid of the weights. And this is what happened when the people of Israel left in haste. Again, it's all about remembering how you came forth. And this is what God keeps saying. Remember the day you left Egypt. Remember it all the days of your life he expects you to. And you know what? We can remember all the days of our life, the day that we were saved by Christ. We can look back to the time when the blood was put on our proverbial doorpost of our hearts. And we can remember how we were in that time. We can remember how we were in bondage to sin and we were trapped by weights that kept us from spiritual truths. And we can remember all of these things and look back to that proverbial Egypt in our lives. And, and that's a good thing for us to often reflect on. And this is why these uh, solemn feasts even exist. It's so the people would be reminded of what God has done in their lives and would always reflect on those things in a cyclical fashion. Three times a year, they would act out what was to come and also act out what had happened and do in remembrance these things. Verse 4 continues, and it says, And there shall be no leavened bread seen with thee in all thy coast seven days, neither shall there anything of the flesh which thou sacrificed the first day at even remain all night until morning. And I love how that's referred to. Get rid of the, uh, the leavened bread. There should be no leavened bread. And also uh, phrases it, there shall anything of the flesh neither be present. So get rid of the flesh too. And that flesh is, is a weight unto us every day we experience and we fight with. We, we uh, have a spirit that lusteth against the flesh. These two are contrary the one to another. And the flesh is what causes that we can't do the things that we ought. We can't do right because that flesh is always hindering us. And that's when Paul confessed, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? 
Who shall deliver me from my rotten flesh? And here he says, in, in that sacrifice, in that solemn feast of the Passover, you get rid of the leaven and then you partake of the flesh after you've slain it and drained the blood. You eat of that flesh, but none of it ought to remain until morning. In other words, once you get up in the morning and you get on your journey, there shouldn't be any of that left. Now, what were they to do with that? Well, the Bible records actually that it should become a burnt offering. You're to burn with fire any leftovers so that all is consumed. Again, picturing Christ as he burned for us and as he gave himself not only on the cross, but suffered the flames of hell for three days and three nights. That Passover lamb in fullness completed all that was necessary for us. He took upon himself not only the suffering of the cross, which I believe some men may have suffered likewise in, in, in the flesh, but Christ did what no man could and, and took that on into the spiritual realm, suffered these things for eternity in a somehow um, in a finite period of time rose from the dead triumphant for our justification in the end because hell could not contain the sinless son of God so no leaven the Bible says in the New Testament purge out the old leaven that ye may be a new lump in Christ and then he says none of that flesh ought to remain until morning but all ought to be consumed I think this also gives us an indication of what you ought to do in the in the wee hours of the night as you're preparing to go to bed. Start getting rid of that leaven. Start, you know, repenting of those sins and praying to God. And get rid of that flesh and all the things that hindered you in the, in the daytime. That way when you go to bed and you wake up, hey, there's no flesh with you at that moment. There's, there's no sin upon you in that moment. You haven't carried that over until the next morning. You've, you've burned it up, as it were. Continuing on in verse 5, Thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in, there thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even, at the going down of the sun, at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. So here... He's saying don't do this in your own house, but this is to be a sacrifice done with the whole congregation at the place that is specified. There is a specified time. There is a specified place. There is an appointment to be made and to be kept by the people of Israel is what he's referring to here. He says, don't do these things in your own place, but I'm going to name a place and I'm going to show you the time. And he's already indicated that it would be the first month the first day of the month when this would start and then seven days after the feast would transpire there's an appointment there's an opportunity that god wants everybody to partake of this holy convocation he refers it to verse 7 continues and says thou shalt roast and eat it in the place which the lord thy god shall choose and thou shalt turn in the morning and go unto thy tents Six days shalt thou eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work therein. This is in another place referred to as an holy convocation. Here it's referred to as a solemn assembly. Solemn means formal. It means dignified. It means serious. It's, it's something that has a somber mentality to it. It's not a rejoicing feast, but rather one of of meditating a formal a, you know you're you're it, you, you can think of it like like a funeral would be not too many funerals you go to and people are celebrating and rejoicing rather this is to be more so somber more, more more sober more calm in 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 its presentation it's a holy it's a separate it's a distinct convocation now at the end of all of these things and what we've seen is the passover and then the feast of unleavened bread at the end of this spring feast once they arrived in canaan there was this other event called first fruits okay the, the the feast of the first fruits and this would indicate though they haven't experienced it yet they haven't entered into the promised land remember the place hasn't been defined yet where they would celebrate these things but when they arrived signifying the resurrection and signifying the quickening of the believers there was the first fruits and in that portion of the feast they would transition from solemn to celebrating and they would bring in the harvest they would they would kick off the harvest time and they would get the first fruits of whatever they had begun to plant that year and for them they were promised to walk into a land that had already 
fields planted, that had already houses furnished, that had everything they needed. They were just going to walk in. The people were going to scatter for the fear of the Lord that came upon them. And they would partake of then the first fruits, picturing Christ, picturing the quickening of the believers, picturing new life as they entered into that promised land. Continue down to verse 9. It says, Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle unto the corn. And so the first fruits come, they rejoice and they eat them, then they get to work. And for the next 49 days, right, seven weeks times seven days, they were working, they were putting their sickle to the corn and bringing in the harvest, and they were also counting and looking forward to what was next. And what was next is verse 10. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with a tribute of a freewill offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God according as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. So seven weeks from unleavened bread kicking off, there would be 49 days, and then the 50th day, this feast of weeks, would kick off when the harvest of corn was coming in, and at this time would be about all in. So they've seen God's provision of the lamb. They've played out his sacrifice, his resurrection of the dead, partook of the first fruits. Then they were laboring and toiling and working in the strength of those first fruits, as it were, all the while receiving of the blessing of God. And then 50th day, they were to bring unto the Lord a freewill offering of their own hand, and this is how it reads it. It says, Of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. So they were to take of all that they have received, and as the, he hath blessed, give something freely back unto the Lord thy God. And that would go into the ministry. That would go into the priest. That would go into the celebrations that were about to take place and all of those things. It would be providing for the work of the ministry. That free will offering, as God hath blessed, was coupled with a time of rejoicing. Because everybody comes, and they're essentially sharing with one another in all that the Lord has blessed. And they're showing their neighbors, and showing their family member, and showing their kindred, look at the bountiful harvest that God has given me. This is just a portion of all that I have in my stores. What a wonderful God. And you can imagine when thousands upon thousands of people showed up to the temple to do the exact same thing, to say, look at all that God has done for me. Of course, that's going to be a great time of rejoicing, a great time of celebrating this feast of weeks, seven weeks times seven days unto the 50th day. This is Pentecost. That's what 50 means. Pentecost is what we're referring to here. So then it's the same thing that we saw in the New Testament, right? Christ was sacrificed. There was a time of unleavened bread and mourning. He rose from the dead. They partook of the first fruits of his resurrection. And then they went working. For them, they were praying. They were hiding away at that time. They were waiting for the promise of the Spirit. And then 50 days later, that promise of the Spirit came upon them. They rejoiced in all that God has done fruitfully in the last uh, 49 days. And then they went out. And what did they do? They got to work. They celebrated, but this kicked off a great work. It wasn't like, look at all that God has done. Now let's kick back and just sit on our hands. No, it was time to get back out there and do more work. This Pentecost, this fifth of weeks, was only one day, one day of celebrating. We remember the, the great harvest that came in Pentecost when Peter preached, right? Remember how there was thousands of people saved. There was that great harvest, but they didn't just stay put. That actually kicked off a great work. They celebrated all that God has done back into the spring, and they looked forward to what they're going to do until fall is up. So, continuing on in verse 12, it says, And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and thou shalt observe to do these statutes. So they said in verse 11, I think I skipped over that, Thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant, thy maidservant, the Levite that is within thy gates, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are among you in the place that, the, that God hath chosen to place his name there. And it was, a, it was a statute of remembrance. And everybody was involved. So like I said, what a great celebration when everybody comes and says, 
for the past seven weeks. Look at what God has been doing in our lives. They wouldn't have seen each other for 50 days for all minding the things that were back home. But God commanded that they would return and they would celebrate and they would rejoice and they would have that time of remembrance one with another. Now we can ask ourselves, how often do you reflect on what the Lord has done? I wonder if there was people that were sitting there and they were trying to, after all the work that had happened since springtime, what has God done? What is he? Do? They're now counting their bushels. They're now counting their store. They're now reflecting on these things and they're going to bring it all together and then give of what God has given unto them. And, and, and the bountiful blessings that have come unto them, they're giving back unto God. We need to be in the spirit of always reflecting on everything that God has done for us, reflecting on all the wonderful gifts he's given us, reflecting on all the wonderful miracles, big and small, that he's done in our lives, thinking about the pit from whence we were dug and the cleft of the rock from which we were hewn, remembering what God saved me from and remembering what God did for me a month ago and a day ago and a moment ago, just always reflecting. And this is what God is always encouraging the people to do through Deuteronomy and especially now we see through the feast. Remember. Do this in remembrance. Here they had two months of labors. Now we can think of our time since Christ died and since Pentecost took place. We now stand about 2,000 years from that event. Now is that just a coincidence that we are now 2,000 years from that resurrection looking forward to the time when he will return? I think not, but it could be. You never know. Coincidence or is an appointment of God that's before us that we're about times a thousand, the same time frame away. When we're looking forward to the next event, we're looking forward to the next feast that's about to take place. And you'll find this when you study them out, if you go back to Leviticus 23, that the first feasts that are mentioned here from Passover into um, the, the Feast of Pentecost, these actually refer to Christ in his first coming. The next one then, turn over and look at verse 13, says, Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after that thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine. So the work continues. The labor continues. They're continuing to gather up. They've already got the first fruits. They've already got the bountiful blessing that came in the springtime. Now they're looking at the latter rain that has provided more for them. Their stores are filling up. They're preparing for a winter that is coming. And how does this Feast of Tabernacles kick off? If you go to Leviticus 23, you'll see it. You don't have to, though. It says trumpets. The sound of the trumpets is what actually kicks off this feast. The Feast of Trumpets happens on the first day of the seven months, where there is a convocation where essentially the blowing of trumpets indicates that we are now at the seventh month and we are now about to kick off the Feast of Tabernacles. On the tenth day, there is another solemn assembly. There is a time of affliction and rest known as the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is one of reflection. It is one of mourning. It is one of revealing yourself unto God. You are seeking atonement from Him for the year that's gone on. All the blessings that He's given you in spite of, O oh, wretched man that I am, you're seeking atonement at, atonement at this time. And it's a good timing for that because from the tenth day to the fifth day, essentially you're able to get a clean slate before God and then the Feast of the Tabernacles actually kicks off. Verse 13, Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after that Thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine. Verse 14, And thou shalt rejoice in thy feast, and thy son, and thy daughter, and thy manservant, thy maidservant, and the Levite, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow that are within thy gates. Seven days shalt thou keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord shall choose, because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thine increase, and in all the works of thine hands. Therefore thou shalt surely rejoice. So the labors are ended. The time is over. It's all concluded. The trumpet has sound. There's a time of atonement that takes place. And next is tabernacle. Next is dwelling. With who? With the Lord. The Bible here reveals that the celebration is with all of your kindred. Son, daughter, manservant, maidservant, Levite, stranger, fatherless, widows, everybody that's within thy gates. For seven days there is a solemn feast, but it must be coupled with rejoicing. And I think that's going to be indic indicative of what happens 
at the time of the trumpet of the Lord sounding, you know, time shall be no more, and then we are all gathered together, that's going to be a solemn time. It's going to be a bittersweet time. Rejoicing with the Lord, let's yet sad for the state of the world at that time. And ultimately at the end of tabernacle, spending time with him, God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. And finally that will be set, settled. But this is what God is indicating is going to happen in the last days. It's a feast that they acted out year by year. It's a solemn offering. They were dwelling in booths. In other words, they stripped themselves of, of their habitation and dwelt in tents for that time, indicating that they're on their way to travel somewhere and they don't know where to. They've become and indicated by their dwelling place for this time that they are strangers and foreigners, even as Abraham was. But they're in their own nation. So what's going on there? They're indicating it's time to travel. It's time to move. The trumpet sounds and we're going to be out of here, essentially, is what's happening. They're to reflect. They're to rest. They're also to rejoice in all the things that God has provided for them. He has blessed them in their increase. He has blessed them in the works of their hands. Therefore, they shall surely rejoice. And we'll see that too at the end of all things, at the end of all time, when, when we die and breathe our last breath or we're caught up together with the Lord in the air, certainly He will bless our increase. Certainly He will bless all the works of our hands that we've done since the time that we first received of that Passover lamb, that we first believed on Christ and asked Him to save us from our sins. We continue on in verse 16. It says, Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. In the feast of unleavened bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles, they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. So there's three feasts here at a minimum where people were to go to the place which God has chose for them. They were to visit this place no matter where they were. They were to descend upon this place minimum three times a year. All the people Israel was to come there before God. And the Bible says here, they shall not appear before him empty. That's where they were to bring whatever was accepted and whatever was required for each one of these three events. Again, there's about seven of them exactly, but he has coupled them into these three main names basically that encompass each one of the events. Don't appear empty. And the Bible says in verse 17, every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. So according to how much God hath blessed you, give as you are able. And this is a great thing for us to consider as New Testament believers. According as God hath blessed you. And really consider this year by year, month by month, day by day. According as God hath blessed you, so give ye whether it's in service, whether it's in financial gift, whether it's in provision, whether it's just in your time and your efforts into the work of God, consider all that God hath blessed you with, the blessings which He hath given you, so ye ought to give according to that. As you're blessed, so you give as you are able. As you are blessed of God, so you render back unto Him and to His people in specific continue on and it changes uh it changes a little bit direction here so those were then the three solemn yearly feasts and there were to be types of what has happened in the exodus and types of what will happen once that trumpet sounds okay and there are also things that are supposed to no matter what time frame we're in remind us of these specific events and help us to meditate upon these things. But ultimately, it seems like what God wants most from us is to remember what He has done, remember what He is going to be doing, and just simply bless according to that. As God hath blessed you, so bless others. That's what God wants to do. He wants to bless Christians, not so, just so that they can get fat and rejoice in all that He has provided for them. He blesses so that they can bless others. He wants it to, He wants to be used he wants men to be he wants to use men to bless others. He wants to work through you is essentially what he wants. Verse 18, judges and officers, shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just 
judgment. So these were to be in the gates. And we've seen that a few times. We remember Lot was found in the gates when the angels entered in. This is typically where the judges would sit. At the, at the point of in and out, they would confirm people. They would judge matters. And I think the wisdom in that is essentially... If somebody's being judged in the gates, it's easy to determine once once the judgment has been made. It's easy to basically act out the next step. Either they're getting kicked to the curb or they're allowed and permitted to enter into the city. So that's where judgment took place, at the crossroads of whether, whether you're in the city or you're out of the city. It, that's where judgment took place. And so God says, appoint judges and officers that should be there throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment so in order to judge justly they needed to be upright they needed to be able they needed to be wise they needed to be knowledgeable in the scriptures these judges and officers needed to essentially be the hand of god in these cases of judgment they were to justly judge they were to appropriately and rightly basically dish out the law and the judgment according, whether it was right or wrong, up or down, whatever the case was, these men were chosen for that specific task. And God said it so. Verse 19, it says, Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. They're not to rest judgment. That means twist. That means alter. That means confuse judgment in cases of judgment. They're not to have respect of persons. In other words, they're not to look at somebody and depending on their class, depending on their language, depending on their race, the color of their skin. They're not to use those indicators as a way to judge people, having respect of persons in these matters, resting their judgment because of these outward things they need to be judged by the law and according to their character in keeping that law therefore judge people based on their standing before the law if if the law says do a and they do b then they're wrong if the just the law says do a and they're a black man and they do a then they're right if if if, it, if you throw that in and they're a white man a, a, a poor man a rich man it shouldn't matter it says do A, you do A, right? That's how God wants judgment to take place. Red and yellow, black and white, these aren't things that God sees. He sees one blood when he looks at any man. Amen. There's nothing rich or poor. God doesn't say, hey, save the poor, believe the rich. He doesn't say, oh, save the rich. They can do great things in my kingdom. Believe the poor to die. No, God wants all men to be saved indiscriminately. He died for the sins of of all mankind. He didn't die for the rich or for the poor. He didn't die for the black or for the white. He died for all people. There is no respect of persons in God's judgment. And when he appoints judges, he expects the same. Therefore, and we know that case. We know the situation that happened in, let's take a biblical example first. The, the situation of James, the book of James. They say, hey, you can't have respect of persons with Christ. You can't walk with Christ and have respect of persons in judgment. A man walks in with gay clothing, bright clothing, rich and wealthy looking clothing and rings upon his fingers and you say, oh, come up and sit here in the favored seat and, and that, that will be your spot. And then he takes the man in vile raiment and makes him into someone's footstool at the back of the room. You can't just look at people based on those characteristics and judge them thereby. Who knows whether the poor man is an upright and a just person and the rich man is, is, a, is a vile, filthy man. Amen. You can't tell that by looking upon them. Therefore, you're to look at the law and judge them accordingly. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous. Judgment is what God expects. And we have the same situation now playing out in our world in that case in the States with that, that, that young man, that teenager, Kyle Rittenhouse. I don't know if you've heard about this. But this, this, uh, this young man went with a weapon to one of these riot scenes to defend store owners. All of the interviews indicate that all this young man wanted to do was to defend the rights of the storekeepers there and to defend their private property. And so he stood by and tried to guard these locations. What happened was when the riots ensued and came down upon him, 
Next thing you know, he is running for his life from a vile group of people that just want to destroy those particular private properties. We had in that scenario where clearly the young man was running for his life. He turned, he fired in self-defense, and I think he would have been destroyed had he not. He had already taken punches with a, he had taken blows with a skateboard to the face. He'd already suffered attacks and violent threats. He'd already been chased for blocks as he tried to get away. If you're running away, you're not an attacker. But what had happened was in, in defending himself, he turned, he fired his weapon, he just charged it. A burglar, a pedophile, and a domestic abuser, criminals, had died in that scenario, and he's left alive. Okay, now the media wants to say that this young man, Kyle Rittenhouse, who's white, a freedom lover, a defender of good and people's properties, trying to help others, he's bad. This burglar, pedophile, domestic abuser, they're rioters, they're attacking people, they're haters of that which is good and 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 love evil and want to do evil and want to do, well they're good and that's how the media is judging it thus and this young man is now being charged with first degree murder you know what first degree murder is supposed to be it's supposed to be when i think to myself i'm gonna get brother yuri and then i take the weapon and i go down there and i do what i do to brother yuri and i kill him that's first degree murder, premeditated, I thought it out, I planned it, I went from point A to point B with the intent to do so, and I did so. That's first degree murder. How can you get a man first degree murder unless you say that, oh, he went down there with the gun? Well, what was in his intent of going down there? To defend private property, and then he was attacked. That's not first degree murder. They could get him for something else, sure, but I mean, that's not righteous judgment. You know what they've done? They've judged according to the appearance. They've judged according to respective persons. They've judged according to their preconceived ideals and notions and the picture that they want to paint for the whole world to see. They've rested judgment. They've twisted it, altered it, confused it, and now evil's good and good is evil, and they present it to you that way. That is wickedness. That is wrong, and the Scriptures is vehemently opposed to that. We continue on in verse 20. It says, That which is altogether just shalt thou follow. Altogether, completely just. Justice is what we ought to follow after. That thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. God here is indicating that when you have righteous judges and righteous officers in the land that are judging altogether justly, you're going to live and you're going to enjoy the land and you're going to inherit and live long and abide in that place. But we have the opposite, of course, where judges are bought by gifts, which is another warning in verse 19 that God said, gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. So even if these judges were at one time righteous, they can be bought by gifts. And that, I believe, has happened many a times. And these officers, the same thing. They're just doing their job. And most of them these days are being told to stand down when the rioters are looting and they're told to stand up and destroy and take out and arrest people that are just trying to mind their own business and do right. People that don't want to wear their mask and do social distancing in their house. People that want to just go about and live freely. That's what the officers are condemning and attacking. And then when it comes time to defend a private property, to defend a city that's being burned by rioters and looters and, 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 base, and, and wicked men of the baser sort, as the Bible says, they're going to stand down and just let it happen. They've been confused. They've been twisted. They've been, their minds are deluded into thinking good is evil and evil is good. And the devil loves to have it so. Judges and officers have been perverted. If they were to judge altogether justly and follow after the word of God, we'd have a much better and much different place to dwell in today. So we're to follow after what is altogether just. We want to live in a peaceful nation. We want to enjoy the peace of God. Think on these things. Whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honest, whatsoever is just, 
whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, and the peace of God shall rule in your hearts. And that's what we want, but that's so far from our leaders. That's so far from the minds of the world at large. Sometimes I believe it's also so far from the minds of Christians. Think on these things. We're allowing Satan to get in when his, his mouthpiece of what the social media world and what the mainstream media world is telling us starts to infect us. And it can happen. When they start saying, oh, this is evil and this is just, you're like, oh, no way. Eh? You watch it a few more times, this is evil, this is just. No, I, I don't believe that at all. The scripture says, this is evil, this is just, this is evil, this is just, this is evil, this is just. Eventually, your mind will be tricked. You will become conformed. Of who a man is overtaken, the same he is brought into bondage. So we ought not let these things in, but let the peace of God rule in our hearts. How do we do that? Whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtue, praise, think on these things. Next time you flip on your social media, is it true? Is it honest? Is it pure? Is it just? Think on it then. That's fine. But is it anything else? Then you are not letting the peace of God rule in your hearts. You're not giving the peace of God ample ground to... to, to to seed in and to, to settle in your hearts. You're going to have the opposite. We need to follow this same rule for the have peace in our nations, but we're so far from that, but it should start with Christians. Judgment must begin at the house of God, okay? We need to start to get into the mindset of having peace rule, okay? Just because we speak peace and there for war, that doesn't matter. We need to keep speaking for peace. We can't bring war back to that same thing. Continuing on verse 21, Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. Neither shalt thou set thee up any image which the Lord thy God hateth. I think the, the second verse there, verse 22, is pretty clear. Don't set up any false image. Don't set up any idols. Don't set up any graven image in the house of God or near unto the house of God. Okay? <laughs> I got to say it, there's a giant outside of First Baptist Church, a giant sculpture of Dr. Jack Howells. Great man as he was, what in the world are Christians doing building idols of him, putting him outside the house of God, and then planting a bunch of trees around him? Okay, that's a grove, and that's strictly condemned by these verses. What in the world are you doing? <laughs> I mean, have you never read Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 21 and verse 22, when it explicitly condemns these things? Now, does God hate trees? Clearly he hates the graven image. Clearly he hates uh, the likeness of anything, whether it's a, a fowl or a, or a bird or a fish of the sea or a man. Whatever it is, he hates graven images and, and people that would worship them. Of course, he, he hates that and despises that. But he's got against trees. How, what's wrong with planting trees outside of, of the altar of the Lord? What's wrong with bringing in a grove and doing that thing? I think it's because God just wants things to be natural. God just wanted things to be the way he made it. What ends up happening is we set up an altar unto the Lord, which you can go to, go to Exodus chapter 20 quickly. You set up an altar to the Lord, and then you start setting up statues around it. Of course, you're now be, you've come into idolatry, and, and that's wickedness, of course. But then on top of that, you then start to plant a beautiful garden around this thing and, and make it look really lovely with types of trees, Exodus 20. And then you start to, to beautify it and to grow this. Well, what happens is God's creation has been then used to become a distraction, whether it's idolatry through statues and you're making images of beasts, or whether it's beautiful trees and you're planting them up all around the altar, you're causing a distraction from Jesus and his altar where the sacrifice to, was to be made, okay? God doesn't have any problem. If you make an altar and there happens to be a tree there, I don't believe that's a big deal. <laughs> but look at what the altar was, and you can see why then it would be a distraction. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 24. An altar of earth, okay? What's more natural than earth, right? That of the earth earthy is the contrast to what is heavenly, right? That is of the earth thou shalt make unto me and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen, and all the places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. The altar was to be of earth, very base, simply an heap of earth, which would have a fire thereon, and that's where the sacrifice took place. 
Verse 25 continues and says, And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, here's provision here, thou shalt not build it with hewn stone, with carved stone, with formed stone, right? It says, For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. God is saying, make it of earth. Start a fire in a heap of earth. If you need to make it of stone, certainly bring in stones and make a heap of those, and that can be your altar. That's just fine. Don't make it go up by steps. Use the natural earth that is all around it. He's saying it's not about the altar, but the Pharisees had gotten to the points where it was all about the altar and what was blessed thereon. It was more about the altar than it was about the gift. They were all about the altar, and certainly they would have had beautiful trees growing around it. I don't think they did because they were still against it, but they could have had, and we have done that before. We've seen that throughout history where they're going to put gra uh, graven images all around it. Look at the Catholic Church. Look at uh, many religions, actually. They'll do that same thing. The altar was a place of solemn offering unto God, and it was supposed to be simple. Keep it simple. Why? Because it's all about you and God and the gift that you're bringing into him. You shouldn't be distracting everything around it. And when there's a beautiful garden, everyone's going to be like, wow, look at this garden and look at these wonderful statues. Where is that altar? Oh, it's that pile of dirt on the ground. And people are going to learn to condemn and, and contempt the altar. Oh, there's nothing nice about this. There's nothing flashy about this. I want to spend my time in the grove and, and not worry about the altar. No, the altar should be the focus and it should be something that is simple, humble, and, 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 and as God prescribed, as God set forth. So that's just a few interesting points there from Deuteronomy chapter 16. And I'm, I'm thankful for God for giving them to us. Let's pray now.